Welcome everyone to the Baseball Blueprint Podcast, your home for all things player development, where we highlight some of the best instructors in the game of baseball. Uh, this program is sponsored by Baseball Blue Book. Baseball Blue Book, are you in the book? I love that. I'm your host, Cody Dennis. Uh, for our first show ever, I'm super pleased to introduce our first guest. This is Trent Mongero. Trent's a National High School Baseball Coach of the Year. He was also named Georgia Coach of the Year twice. He spent over 30 years at the high school level while also authoring the nationally acclaimed book, Winning Baseball. He's presented at the ABCA as, as along with 10 other plus uh, baseball conventions, which is awesome. Uh, during this, he also provides infield clinics. Uh, he uses his knowledge and his connections to show these clinics along with his son, Tabor, with Dirt Bro Baseball. Uh, Trent, we're super great. We're super happy to have you. This is awesome. Uh, this is a guy who I've really wanted to learn a lot from. So thanks for being on the show. Absolutely, Cody. I feel honored to be the first, hopefully of many. This is awesome. This is awesome. So let's get right into it. Uh, so, so Trent, what initially drew you into coaching and, and, and kind of how did your career begin? Yeah, so um, I had a, an inspiration, kind of a, an odd inspiration, if you will. Basically, when I was a high school baseball player, um, I had aspirations of playing in college and, and maybe one day playing professionally. And uh, I had a really difficult high school baseball experience. And I literally made a promise to myself at that time that when my career came to an end, at whatever point that was, that I would go back and be a high school baseball coach and try to give to others what I didn't receive myself or what I perceived to be a better way. And I really forgot about that as I pursued my journey throughout college and professional baseball. And once I was released from the Braves, I was soul searching, if you will, and uh, walking the beaches of North Carolina, Wrightsville Beach, to be exact. And uh, it just hit me like just hit me out of the blue, kind of like a God thing and just said, uh, you know, you made a promise to yourself you'd be a high school baseball coach. And, and I literally went back to UNCW the next day re-enrolled i had already graduated um and pursued a a coaching career teaching coaching career in the state of north carolina in order to be a head baseball coach or a head coach in, of anything you had to have a teaching degree so um that's what i pursued and i've stuck with it now 33 years i've been coaching at the high school level so that's awesome. So so in your experience with that, what were some of the earlier challenges you faced coming from, you know, being an ex player and then making that move to the high school game? Um, you know, there was many challenges as a young coach and, and there's challenges even today, you know, as quote unquote a veteran. But um, I would say that putting too much emphasis on the wins and losses and specifically living and dying with every play that took place in games. Like I was so vested in wanting to do good and wanting to help players, but I, I didn't understand the dynamic of how much impact I had on my players by my demeanor. Um, you know, they feed off my energy positively and negatively. For instance, if I'm carrying tension, you know, um, I'm arguing every call. Everything was such a big deal. Well, I've, they, 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 uh, they tend to take on that same characteristic, you know, and they don't play the game relaxed, which is critical. So I think that was a, a big piece of it was, you know, I was also a perfectionist and um, I still like to do things the right way, but I also give myself a little bit of grace, you know, don't take myself so serious anymore. And, uh, you know, truly understand that it's really about people and relationships and, you know, the players having fun. So, you know, it's certainly been a, a progression over the years, but uh, it's been, it's been a, a fun one and a worthwhile one. That's awesome. So on that, on that same note, when it comes to your teaching techniques or your philosophy, let's, let's say that way, how has that evolved over time? And you mentioned patience. Is there anything else that you could kind of point to us and say, here was some growth that I've shown? I just think that, you know, another piece of this is understanding your players. Um, you know, what, what type of team do you have from year to year? You know, like, um, are you more of a, you know, speed? How is speed implemented on the, on the team? What kind of pitching depth do you have? 
Are you more of a power hitting team? You know, are you more, you have to focus more on uh, winning games with, with small ball, for instance. Um, you know, I, I just think initially as a young coach, I really just coached the same from year to year. And then I started really trying to coach based on my talent, you know, that, that things change. I also realized very young that my JV program, my middle school program, even the youth program were critical in the overall development of players and creating a championship program. Like when you first start, you know, you pay attention to the varsity so much and you tend to forget the importance of what's coming up underneath you. And that's the essence. Once I figured that out and it didn't take long, you know, just one or two graduating classes. And all of a sudden you're looking at these young guys that you weren't paying that much attention to realizing they're your future. You know, um, it, it kind of hit me upside the head that I got to do a better job. And that's really when. I took development to a whole nother level, you know, literally started recording some videos, um, you know, some how to videos for youth coaches and, you know, middle school coaches and, you know, just teaching the game, just trying to find any way possible to impact my players and my future players without them physically having to be right there with me with instruction. So, you know, I would say just, Understanding the big picture more, really, than just being caught up in the moment. I dig it. I dig it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So from, from that standpoint, and, and you've been doing this for a long time, are there some technical notes in terms of just teaching points that you maybe didn't address early on that you're now addressing differently or, or you're starting to look at more? Um, I've always been a detail-oriented guy. Um, I would say that my – emphasis on catch play, which has always been big, you know, even 30 years ago is even more so now. Um, also preventive maintenance, um, arm care with bands, you know, implementing that. We never did that, you know, 30 years ago, the, the prehab element mm -hmm. of banding, um, you know, tying in the weight room, functional lifting, you know, what truly is, you can imagine over 30 years, like all the things that have evolved techniques and weight training and, you know, what's right in the weight room, what's wrong in the weight room, you know, um, trying not to go down these rabbit trails of things that are not good for players uh, that we once thought were good for players, you know, whether it be technique. Um, so just constantly being a student of the game, really, and trying to give my players what I feel like is the best, you know, what is going to give them the best chance to be the best version of themselves. Well, I love it. That's awesome. So when you when you talked about, you know, your players receiving this information, are there some intangibles that you see like, hey, this is a guy who really gets it that you see are just prime for player development when it comes to the individual players? So explain that a little further. I want to make sure. No, I absolutely. So what physical and, and mental traits are you seeing when you're instructing these guys that say, OK, this kid's going to pick this up quick. This is a guy who's really got a shot to be great here. Yeah. So, so coaching in a nutshell is teaching. Yeah. And, and teaching is understanding where players are at individually, you know, what motivates them, what knowledge base do they have? What skill base do they have, you know, and being able to meet them where they are and give them, you know, the steps to order their steps for improvement. It's not a blanket type approach. And you're talking about, 14 to 21 players on a roster, you know, so it, it's very individualized. And to me, the best coaches are the best teachers, you know. So there's definitely this this growth of being able to assess where a player's at and then understanding, like, what flaws do they have? What drills will attack those flaws? Um, what is maybe overall skill development that all the players need? such as like the catch play routine, you know, that's not individualized. That's we do as a, you know, there are elements within the catch play routine that are position specific, yeah. but overall it's pretty much a routine that they all do. That's very similar. So, you know, versus like, say, uh, you know, I'm looking at you hitting in the cage and being able to assess like what I think 
you do well as far as using your body? What type of hitter are you? And not trying to cookie cutter, you know, every single player based on, say, like what worked good for me, you know, or what I saw on a video on the Internet. Um, so experience is, is a big key. Um, confidence is a big key. Um, and we don't ever have it all figured out. Like, you know, I, I'm just I hate the word guru. You know, I, the, to me, that person doesn't exist. We're passionate coaches and um, we do our very best, you know, and the players that care and the players that want to get better, you know, are going to be the ones that embrace this stuff the most and grow the most, you know? So you're dealing with all different types of personalities. Like what is this kid at the high school level? What do they really want out of their high school baseball experience? Not everybody wants to play in college, you know, or be a professional. Some just want a quality high school baseball experience. And I try to inspire them with the whys. Like if you're going to play, let's be the best version of yourself. And in order to be the best version of yourself, and give yourself the best chance to start and the best chance to contribute and the best chance to win, we have to take care of these elements offensively, defensively, and so forth. And if you buy into that, you got a chance. And if you don't, you're going to make things really difficult for yourself, you know? Um, so it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to it, you know, and that's just managing what's on the field. We're not even, you know, talking about everything else that goes on off the field, you know, fundraising and yeah. parental meetings and, you know, cuts and tryouts and, you know, aggravated players, aggravated parents. Yeah. The list goes on and on, right? Gotcha, gotcha. I, I love what you, you said at the beginning there about how coaching is teaching. And yes, your experience going back into the world of education once you were done playing, how did that impact the way you then went about your, your coaching? Was that something that you could reflect on? Yeah, um, I think – you know, the ability to communicate and break things down in a way that makes sense um, is something that people have always told me that I, I was blessed with. Uh, you know, like, man, you, you make it make sense, you know, and we got to be careful because you got to know how much to give somebody like you can overwhelm them. Right. You can the paralysis by analysis, just, you know, understanding like, OK, this this player needs this nugget right here. Let's master this and then we can move on. So can you talk it? Can you show it, like demonstrate it? You know, um, you know, uh, can you give them examples maybe of other players or professional players or video? Can you video them and break it down and show them their flaws? Um, it's that's just being a master teacher. And, um, you know, that takes time. So I think when you go through the educational process, if you really buy into it, teaching, you know, um, and the philosophies of teaching and understand how people learn, um, you just get better at it. You know, it's, it's just like anything in life. If you truly care and you want to be your best, you know, you grow and, you know, you start off green and you do your best and, and you just, you kind of morph, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just not the same guy that I was 33 years ago. But, but in a way I am. So when I see my players from back then, I sometimes apologize to them because they'll be like, they'll say very positive things to me. Like, man, we, you know, we were blessed to have you. It was such a great experience. And I found myself going, I'm so glad that you say that. But I mean, like, I feel like what I could give you now compared to what I gave you then, they're like, what you gave us, you know, was, was more than enough. But, you know, it's, it's all a journey. It's just a journey of, of becoming the best version of yourself along with the players doing the same thing. Awesome. Speaking of journeys, you and your son Tabor are on a journey right now showcasing infield camps across the country. Uh, your, your group, Dirt Bro Elite Camps, is incredible. I've seen some of the locations you go to, and you make yourselves accessible to pretty much every aspect of, of, of youth baseball, high school baseball. I mean, it, it's one of those things where you don't see a whole lot of, you know, family-run camps being able to sh share that much information that much that wide. So with that in mind, what inspired you to start pursuing those nationwide camps and clinics? Well, I've always done like elite camps. Um, you know, as a high school coach, I would bring in the best people. I was never intimidated by knowledge, like people that knew more than myself. Um, 
And I think that's an important quality to have as a coach. So I would bring guys like Tim Hires, um, who ended up being one of my dearest friends, actually helped me with the winning baseball stuff and many other. He's the big league hitting coach for the Texas Rangers. The last, this is his third year with them. And you've seen what they've done within three years of him being there. So when I bring in those guys and, and they're, we're doing camps together, I'm picking their brains. I'm trying to learn them, you know, um, but I did, I've done these camps. So I've done elite infield camps. That was my passion. I was an infielder at the division one level and I had, uh, you know, some really good in, instruction in college. And I, I've always felt like I, you know, that was a position that I could really teach. Well, it was something that I did and, and I was passionate about. So I would always have elite infield camps and, you know, elite hitting camps. We just did camps all the time. Um, and then I, I saw that there was a need, you know, that there's a there's not much quality instruction out there. I mean, and we're talking now going back before Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all this information that's out there now, um, which I think also is, is dangerous. Like all that information is great, but it's dangerous because I think a lot of it is misleading. You know, we can talk about that if you want in a minute. But um so I, w I was well received in my instruction. I felt like my players over the years, I was able to bring out the best in them as infielders, uh, the ones that played infield and help them pursue their ability to move on to the next level. Um, and, you know, there, there's a need. There's, there's all this hitting instruction. There's all this pitching instruction. But the defensive element of the game, especially infield in particular, was neglected. And... So hence the, the elite infield camps. And then instead of people having to constantly come down to me, it just made sense from a business standpoint to let's start taking it to the masses. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a demand for it. And when you do things well and your intent is good, you know, it reflects in the product. And so when you do a good job, you're, you become more in demand. You know, people want that experience again. They talk. Now other people are bringing you in. It's very humbling for that to happen, but that's where we're at. And right now, like up till de December, we have about 20 different, lo you know, locations, 20 different camps. I mean, so almost half of the year we're literally traveling doing camps. Now, Tabor coming on board, um, you know, you're talking about my son who grew up underneath me, um, you know, was Georgia player of the year. Um, Division one shortstop, you know, played all all of his entire career, I think, except 11 games did he not start in college of his entire career. Like, you know, so he has tremendous experience. He's a he's a, um, you know, grew up with it with a coach. He's a coach on the field. He's got superior baseball, like, not because he's somebody special. He just embraced all the teachings, not just from me, but, you know, like Tim Hires, as I mentioned, Steve Springer with quality at bats is like, my, you know, one of my other best friends. And he's got all these, you know, I've been able to just surround him because of people that I know with quality minds. And he's just kind of absorbed it all. And, um, you know, now he's hired. He, he just got hired, you know, by UNC Wilmington as their director of player development. And he just graduated and finished playing last year. You know, he was the starting shortstop at UNCW last year. Now he's on staff. And, you know, I think that's a testament to Tabor. So when we go to these camps, <clears throat> I'm the old guy, you know, like I can still demo it. You know, I just pulled my calf like two weeks ago, you know, like I'm, I'm vulnerable, gotcha. you know, but uh, he can get in there and mix it up with them. And, and he, and they relate, you know, he just finished doing what these players are aspiring to do. And so to have, you know, my experience and knowledge, but yet you have him being able to literally mix it up, mix it up with them, demo everything at a very high level, um, talk to these players, and, you know, uh, and share with them, this is what it's going to take. And he's young and they can relate to him. So I think it's just a beautiful mix of old and young. Yeah. Um, and he and I, of course, are on the same page with our instructions. So. It, it works very well together, and it's a blessing to be able to do that with my son. That's awesome.
it's a, it's a great environment you guys create as well. And I, I kind of want to branch off out of that question and, and kind of direct it more towards today's youth players. From what you've seen throughout the camps you've already given and, and from your experience in the past, what are you seeing today's infielders uh, facing in terms of challenges? And I think you, you, you touched on the, the accessibility to, to information as well, if you want to continue with that. All right. So, yeah, it's two piece. So let's t- let's touch on that first. You know, there's so much information out there. I think a lot of it is can be misleading because pe- people that create content often do so to get views or clicks. Yeah. Right. And it's just like, I don't know, I, let's just say the Bible, mm-hmm. you know, like if you just pull a couple sentences and sentences out of the Bible, you don't really have the context right. at which those sentences so when you see a short little video clip, if you don't really understand the whys and the hows, like what is the intent yeah. here? You know, you can start to get lost. For instance, you get lost in your work, um, meaning you flip on the, you know, your phone, you see a cool drill on Instagram. Hey, let's do that today. You know, oh man, did you see this, this other drill over here? Let's do that one today. Like, and then, you know, you're over here on, on TikTok and you see that, man, let's add that. And like, there's really no plan or process that makes sense, you know, from a building block standpoint, it's just these random drills that look kind of cool. Um, and I'm not saying that you can't gain anything from that. It's just, you know, if you want to get from point A to point B, if you want to become an elite player, the journey should be, should be planned. It should, you know, be ordered. There should be logic, logical sequencing to what you're doing. Yeah. And sometimes less is more and simple is better. Right. And, and you can't, you know, you know, they get caught in these complex drills. And as you've seen on the Internet here lately, there's been a lot of parodies created, yeah. like all the drills and how stupid they are. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I think as a parent, you know, I know for infield play, for instance, you know, that, you know, Ron Washington represents the same brand that I do. PB Pro gloves. We're both like, uh, you know, reps, the high level reps for that. And, and I think the world around Washington. So please, you know, I'm just saying this is how things can be taken out of perspective. A lot of Ron Washington drills emphasize the press action, yeah. which is taking the glove away from the body to really to, to make a short in between hop, a short hop. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes he's doing it two hands, one hand. Well, that's one glove action of three that we use as infield. But if you are a parent or a player and you don't know any better, you would think that that's what you're supposed to do every time on every ground ball. And um, and hence, now you're lost. Okay, You're lost in your work because you're literally working on the press at the high levels. 5% of the time Maybe. do we actually press. Maybe. Because right? those guys could be hops. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. That's right. They play on really nice surfaces and they know how to move their feet and they know how to read hops. So it's really more like usually slow rollers or high choppers that they got to come in. But um, again, though, but you could have a parent or a player that's literally practicing 100 percent of the time on just pressing. Um, So, you know, you got to be careful there. Now, the second part of the question was was what, again, you were talking about towards the challenges you guys kind of see these younger guys facing. Yeah. So I think the vast majority of young players are not proficient in their throw in their catch play and their throwing their ability to throw. Okay. I would say if you asked even high school players, you know, what percentage do you, of high school players do you think are elite in their catch play? Like, you know, elite throwers, they'd probably say, I don't know, six or seven out of 10, you know, like in a good program. And I would say that it's probably one out of 10. Um, you know, 10%, uh, across the country, it might even be less than that, you know, at the high school level. And it's such a critical, now we're talking defense here, you know, there's two parts to the game, offense and defense, but in order to play the game, you got to be able to play both sides. You know, there's only 30 DHs in the world out of now we're almost eight, 8 billion. Is that right? I think we're close to 8 billion. So. There's only 30 DHs in the world. You better learn how to play defense. Um, you know, professional DHs. Yeah. So, anyways, um, 
you know, my point is you got to learn how to, to throw and catch at an elite level. And I just think that players, um, they don't buy into that. And coaches don't emphasize it enough. And to me, it's the most important thing that you can teach because the people that can play catch at an elite level, and I'm not just talking about sitting there just randomly playing catch. I'm talking about taking them through a series of dynamic, game-like, uh, functional throwing drills that transfer you know, into actual game play. And when you can execute those drills at an elite level, with tremendous accuracy and precision, you know, that's going to show up. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's going to show up in the game at any level. And people have a misconception that young players can't grasp that kind of stuff, and that's not true at all. You know, like, I mean, you know, yeah. Is a T-ball player going to be able to do it? No. But there's probably, like, two of the two or three of the drills that a T-baller could probably learn how to do over time. You know, and I also believe heavily in this philosophy of self-organization. I think if you give people quality things to do, uh, processes, that they will figure it out over time. Um, Their bodies learn how to transfer energy, uh, learn how to repeat themselves. Um, So that goes from the offensive and the defensive side. If you teach good drills that are like, core drills uh, we call them on our website you know like the big six infield drills you know like if you learn those six infield drills so now we're talking about infield play specifically and you do those six infield drills regularly with intent okay not just going through them to go through them um, you are going to improve because those drills Every one of those drills transfers over into actual gameplay. The actions are in the drill because you need those actions to be able to execute. So, you know, I think that um, from the offensive side, I think there's a a big there's a big gap in the ability to execute simple things like bunting, um, which I think help improve hitting. Yeah. You know, the hand-eye coordination to be able to sack bunt, to drag bunt, to push bunt, to slash, to hit and run. You know, like, that's all barrel manipulation. It teaches you, it's kind of like Pepper used to do, you know, like, you learn how to manipulate a barrel, when how to get on top, how to get underneath, how to stay inside, how to get outside a little bit if you want to pull on purpose. Um, And um, so everybody's all about exit velo you know, and velo on the mound. And, you know, I just think that comes in time. Yeah. I think as you grow up and you learn how to play this game the right way, that stuff shows up. So, I mean, I understand why people are confused because, you know, you go to a recruiting some, you know, you get into high school and the recruiters are looking at the, your numbers, right. right? So you can get lost in trying to create those numbers. And I get it. But, but when you get to college or you play in a really good high school program, you better know how to play the game. Yeah. You better be able to, you know, be able to hit a curveball, you know, be, be able to recognize a changeup, be able to execute a bunt defense, a first and third, a rundown, a cutoff relay, be in the right place at the right time. You know, like that's the stuff that, that turns the game into chess as opposed to like this checkers where we just stand up there and swing as hard as we can. Right and get the best exit velo we can possibly get. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's scary in a way because it's easy to get lost in all of that stuff. And, well, and it's, you it's know, a unique situation for youth players too because a lot of those kids who are less mature, like the game calls for a little bit more action from that skill set. And so you're seeing a right. lot of kids miss out on some value they could be outputting because of what they're seeing in different sites. And I think it comes down to – uh, an ability to filter information correctly, right? If, if you're a kid who's able to really have some self-awareness and say, hey, this is awesome stuff, but physically, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to be able to produce this right now, right? So right. you drive your you drive your development based on what you can filter. And and for, like, like you said, for these youth programs and youth, youth players, 
there is just so much information out there. Um, and I think you'll, we'll probably start to see the, the cream rise to the top as, as more of an IQ type player because of that, because right. they have to hunt that, that better quality information. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, probably the, the most dangerous um, scenario from a youth standpoint is players that are more physical, physically advanced yeah. at a young age. So the 12 year old age is kind of the one that I point to the most because mm -hmm. At 12, you, you got the kids where the hormones have really started to kick in, the growth process, um, and then you got these little midget players. That, that's probably not a politically a, you know, appropriate name. So I apologize for that, using that name. But that's old school for very small. And um, So you have the very small player, right, um, who's not growing at all, and they are doing everything that they can to survive, and they have to be smarter. They have to be more consistent. They have to find a way to help. And then the big field that happens in high school, shortly after 12, by the time you're 14, you're playing on a big field. Yeah. Field that exposes, it exposes so many weaknesses. You know, that player that was the dominant 12 year old, just because he was bigger and stronger with like swinging a trampoline bat on a tiny little field, you know, hitting home runs, thinks he's a home run hitter. And then you get out on that high school field, you know exactly where I'm yeah. going with this. It's just a routine fly ball, oh, yeah. you know. And now that little guy that had to fight, claw, you know, scrap to get on the field starts to grow up a little bit. But he's created a little work ethic, a little process. You know, he's a little tougher and meaner and knows how to fight. And then the next thing you know, they just go oh, yeah. right on past that other guy. Um, so, it, you know. It's just one of those things that's been going on for a long time. But as a parent, if you're listening, as a player, if you're listening, you got to be careful that you're not that guy. Yeah. Because 12-year-old baseball does not – it's kind of like the halftime in an NFL football game. It means absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's totally irrelevant. Okay? So we're, we want the score at the end of the game. And the score at the end of the game is, you know, your high school experience. How are you doing by your junior, senior year or when you're good enough to contribute to the varsity or start playing showcase – baseball you know better quality travel ball at the higher levels um where you can truly show the type of player that you are and um so it is a journey and those are some of the the obstacles i think we're up against Makes sense. speaking of journeys you played for a gentleman named mark scaff at unc wilmington correct Sure did. So you noted him as having a large impact on your life. And I, this is, I'm quoting from an ABCA presentation you gave way back when, but yeah. can you kind of give us a little bit of an idea of, of how he kind of ran your player development situation there? And then and also just maybe a, a good memory that you had, you had with the fellow. Sure. I was so in my journey as a player, you know, I, I went to Florida Southern and then, I transferred to junior college right down the road. I played at South Florida community college in Avon park. They call them South. They have fancier names now, yeah. but it was FCC back then South Florida community college. And, um, and then I ended up at UNC Wilmington. And when I got to UNCW, I finally had a coach in Mark Scaff who was ahead of his time when it came to being able to break skills down and do exactly what I talked about at the beginning of the podcast. He saw where I was at, saw that I had some athleticism, you know, and he was able to build in the skills of infield play into me. And I was like Tabor. I, we were both very little. And I mean, on the low end of the scale, little coming out of high school, like graduating at 138, 140 pounds. You know, um, that was both me and Tabor. You know, by the time we're like, you know, juniors, when I got to UNCW, I was a junior. I'm like 150, 155, then 160. But I was, you know, strong enough to move over from second to short. Tabor played short the whole time. He was coached up since he was a little boy. I, I was not in high school, as I mentioned, as my inspiration to be a coach. Yeah. And then I really, even at Florida Southern, I didn't get it. They were recruiting players at that time that were polished players that could step in. I, I needed somebody that was going to really teach me the game, you know, take this piece of clay and this little switch hitting 140 pound kid who could run a little bit and had a good arm and teach him how to play. And when I got to UNCW, 
That's exactly what Mark did. Um, he moved me over to shortstop. I got in the weight room more, um, the fundamental fielding mechanics, you know, drills to improve my lateral movement, to read hops, uh, to throw on the run. Uh, you know, we did the throwing routine every day. Um, you know, we had our set drills that we did all the time in the infield and, you know, the ability to, to make feeds. Here's how you make a flip feed. Here's how you make a rocker feed. You know, here's the technique. Here's how you shave split seconds as you're trying to, you know, handle a runner, understanding the different types of run. Just all this stuff, whether it be physical or mental, you know, the, the IQ of playing shortstop. And, um, he gave it all to me, and I wanted every bit of it. I was a sponge. And he's definitely one of the greatest mentors and, and one of the – Greatest experiences I had, you know, Tabor and I do four camps, four of our dirt bro infield camps at UNC Wilmington. Um, we go back and, you know, we do them there. And of course he's, he's on staff and, and I'm kind of like an unofficial ambassador of the university, as you see, yeah. I'm decked out and all that stuff. Um, but, um, you know, he's officially on staff, but Mark came and worked a, a camp at one of our camps. Um, literally he just, he just was there. Because typically it's me and Tabor, by the way. We Most people don't understand. Like, we coach 40 to 60, sometimes 70 infielders with just the two yeah. of us, eight hours a day. And they think, oh, my gosh, how do you possibly do that? Everybody's standing around. Nobody's standing around. They, you have to see it yeah. to understand the, the dynamics. But um, so Mark just wanted to come and watch. And then the next thing you know, I'm like, get in here, coach, you know. And um, so just having him. And Tabor never got to play. For, for Coach Gaff, he was just like a year away. In fact, when they started recruiting Tabor, you know, Mark was just retiring. So we, we almost had, you know, that kind of cool experience yeah. uh, to be able to play, you know, for the same infield guy. But he got it indirectly. Tabor got it indirectly because I would say the foundation of who I am as an infield coach is based on what I learned from Coach Gaff. Awesome. And then I've built in, obviously, you know, you just learn and grow so much. I mean, I think Mark would tell you, you know, I know he said it to me, you know, you've taken this to a whole nother level. You know what I mean? Well, you know, that's the goal. We always want to take what we do and, and make it better. Yeah. Um, but he's certainly the core foundation. And, uh, you know, the, we used to pick pick on uh, Coach Scaff because he was short. Um, you know, he was a little guy. And uh, when, when I was a player for him, you know, so – we don't don't really have that many funny stories because it was always pretty serious when we got out there to work. And as you can see, I'm kind of looking out in my mind right now as to, you know, what exactly do I want to share? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I remember taking a photograph one time of a pair of cleats with a hat on top of it and got down on there. And, uh, you know, we put it on his desk and said we had, a, you know, a picture of him. And, of course, he thought, funny and we he hung it up on on his wall i mean you know stupid little things but really it was more like knocking on his door every day hey coach you think you could come hit me some ground balls yeah. sure and he would just hit, hit him to me and hit him to me and hit him to me these are like outside of practice yeah. you know he really wanted to see all of us not just me become our best versions of ourselves so you know he was just an assistant at the time he was you know he was the recruiting coordinator and Bobby Guthrie was my head yeah. coach. So, you know, I had both Bobby Guthrie and Mark Scav as my mentors. Um, when I first became a coach, I leaned on them both heavily, yeah. you know, for practice organization, for development. And then of course I always did camps when I was at UNCW and that, and that kind of leads back. If I can piggyback yeah. into the, you know, how the camp stuff started, uh, you know, I remember doing a hitting camp at UNCW when I was a player there. And it was raining like it does a lot in the summer in Wilmington, North Carolina. And we went up into the gym, the old New Hanover gym, the older gym. And we had this big wrestling room in there. I don't know why, because we didn't have wrestling as a sport, but we had a wrestling room. And uh, I think the cheerleaders used it. But anyway. We're walking up there with all the campers and Scaff comes up behind me and taps me on the shoulder. He said, uh, by the way, you're doing the hit and talk today. And I, I was like, I mean, the fear of God went into, I was like, my heart went down into my stomach. 
I'm like, how, you know, what, what? Coach, what do you mean? Like, you serious? Yeah, you're going to do the hit and talk. And right then and there, my mind started to think like, okay, sequentially, what are the most important things? What are the foundation yeah. of hitting and then and building? And I just kind of, I didn't even get to take notes, but I just did it from logic and just my mind being able to speak and think ahead to what the next thing was where I wasn't like all jumbled and out of order. Yeah. And that was kind of the beginning of it all. Like he pretty much said, um, you know, you did an outstanding job. And, you know, they started giving me more responsibilities at the camps to lead, you know, whether it was hitting or base running or fielding. Yeah. And I got more confidence doing it. And it was kind of a, a rush, you know, a different kind of rush than, than you get as a player, but similar. You know, it's like the adrenaline of speaking. And, you know, that culminated – 30 years later, 35 years later, having to speak at the ABCA on the big stage in front of 6,000 of my peers, oh, yeah. you know, the college and, uh, you know, having Tim Corbin in the front row taking notes, you know, and you have to present for 45 minutes or 50 minutes. And, uh, you know, I never in a million years. I remember going to the ABCA, you know, so many years yeah. and sitting there going, I want, could I do that? You know, like asking myself, could I do that? Like, could I be up there talking on that stage? You know, would I have the confidence, you know, to do it and then actually getting to do it? It was a uh, pretty surreal and an, an amazing experience. So you've seen the growth from the kid who was a player being thrust into a teaching moment to writing books, to doing videos, to, you know, now doing camps across the country and, and even speaking at, at these major events. Uh, state associations I speak at all the time. You know, that's what you alluded to, yeah. those 10, 10 different states. I think it's close to 15 now, different wow. states. I spoke at their conventions, and it's a huge honor. It's a huge honor. And I usually talk about catch play, mm -hmm. uh, teach, the, you know, our catch play routine, which is available on our, on our website. Um, so if you go to Dirt Bro USA, D-I-R-T, Dirt Bro, B-R-O, USA.com, you'll see the different products that we have. You know, we have the, the catch play routine. Um, we have our big six infield drills, must know, time tested, time proven infield drills. And then we have the hitting stuff with uh, Tim Hires uh, building the complete hitter, which is pretty, you know, it's all legit time tested stuff that works not pie in the sky trying to, you know, make a million bucks. And we've tried very hard to keep the prices down and yeah. reasonable because we, we want it to be affordable yeah. to, to your body. That's so, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And if you guys haven't checked it out, like Trent said, go to the website, dirtbrousa.com. You're going to be able to have access to information about his camps, all the uh, resources and tools that they're able to, to offer to the community. So, we're definitely uh, very lucky to have had him on the podcast. And I just want to say thank you again, Trent. This was awesome. Uh, this is something that I've been wanting to get going for a little bit, and I couldn't have dreamed of a better first guest than you. So thank you for jumping on. Awesome. It's been an honor. And um, anybody out there in Internet world uh, has any questions, just shoot them to me. I, I do my best. If you'll follow Instagram, um, usually Instagram, I follow most everybody back. And I try to answer questions on Instagram a lot. Twitter, my Twitter account, I really don't follow a lot of people on Twitter, but I try to, you know, give out quality information um, as much as I possibly can. Winning Baseball is my Facebook group account. Um, and, of course, you could go there if you're a Facebooker. And then, you know, the YouTube, I, I haven't put in that much stuff new on YouTube. Um, I've actually pulled some stuff down off of YouTube because we presented in the products or I, it might be outdated, you know, like the winning baseball, for instance, the winning baseball, it was two books yeah. that Tim and I did that we were paid to write. Um, they weren't self-published. They were traditionally published means you're paid to write them um, and do them. You know, I would say that 5% of the information, now those books are past 15 years old, about 15 years old now, 5% of that information if I had to do it over, I would change. That's why you have second and third editions of textbooks. You know, things change, information changes. And as you know, we have a lot more knowledge now because video mm -hmm. has become so prevalent. We understand processes and how the body works better. 
So my point is I pulled some stuff off YouTube because um, I just felt like it was maybe a little antiquated or outdated. Um, and I just didn't want to lead anybody astray, but there's still a lot on the, on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, winning baseball. Awesome. Make sure you guys check that out. So Trent, thanks again yeah. for, for jumping on the podcast. We appreciate having you, uh, enjoy UNC Wilmington's big win today. Congrats to them on getting yeah. to the regionals and, uh, we will see you guys next episode. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome.